What's up, everybody, and welcome back to this deep dive and on time and hyperlapse photography. So in the first five videos of this series, we've looked at everything from the basics of what a time lapse and hyperlapse are, to how to prepare to shoot one, to setting up your Canon photo or cinema camera to actually shoot it. Now we're going to look at some of the supporting hardware you can use to transform your time lapse into a hyperlapse or at least the supporting hardware that I have that I've used to do this. Now, admittedly, you don't always need fancy hardware to create hyperlapses, but in many situations, some kind of motion control hardware is necessary to pull these shots off. And that brings me to the hardware you see here. This is an Edelkrone Slider Plus Pro, obviously slider, and a DJI RS3 Pro gimbal. Now, I didn't buy either of these specifically for time-lapse work, but surprisingly, at least to me, they both have time-lapse functionality built in. Now, in the last video, we looked at Edelkron's slider in depth. And in this video, we're going to look at the DJI RS3 Pro gimbal in depth with a lot of comparative uh, aspects looking back at towards the Edelkron as well. So, Let's look at the gimbal itself, and I think the best place to start with is the physical setup. Now, I'm only going to focus on the time-lapse specific considerations in this video. If you're interested in a more complete review of the DJI RS3 Pro gimbal, I have one in the works, and hopefully we'll be getting that out soon. Now, if you saw the last video where we looked at Edelkron's slider, then you might be expecting there to be a ton of complexity here with different operating modes and workarounds for various implementations and limitations and so on and so forth. Interestingly, and much to my surprise, that's not actually the case. In fact, many in many ways, the DJI gimbal is easier to get to grips with than the Edelkron slider was as there simply aren't as many edge cases to deal with. Now, for starters, you don't need anything but the gimbal, or at least anything other than what comes in the box with the gimbal. On top of that, you don't have to worry about a power source. The RS3 Pro has a built-in battery, so there's no power situation you have to consider. And if that's not sufficient for your time-lapse needs, then the only option you have for extending the power is the USB-C port on the RS3 Pro to power it. Now, likewise, there is no need to consider what head you're going to use because, well, the gimbal is it. About the only real consideration that you have to have is how you're going to set up and balance your camera rig. Now, this is going to be especially relevant if you need to power your camera from an external battery pack to get a sufficient record time. Even then, the truth is that has more to do with building out your camera's rig than it does with using the gimbal itself. Now, all that said, balancing your camera is really important, even or maybe even especially in a time-lapse application. As with any gimbal, when it's on, the motors are always being are always using power to keep the camera in position. However, the more they have to fight an unbalanced camera to keep that camera in position, the more power they will consume. Now, for a time lapse, which can be up to six hours long on the RS3 Pro, minimizing that power use is definitely a good thing. So, balancing is important. Now, DJI's approach to camera control is also fundamentally different from Edelkron's. Instead of using the camera's remote release terminal like Edelkron did, DJI has opted to provide both USB and Bluetooth connections to your camera. Now, of course, not all cameras will support both operations or options, and not all functions are supported in both modes of operation, depending even on cameras that are supported. Now, while this approach allows for more flexibility and control over the camera system at least most of the time. It also puts us at the mercy of what functions both the camera makers make available through their various camera control APIs, as well as what parts of those APIs DJI chooses to implement. Moreover, since it's not a simple electrical circuit, there's no easy way to adapt it to work with your own electronics if you're inclined to do that. And here's where the problem crops up, whether due to DJI's implementation decisions or limitations in Canon's remote control API, the RS3 Pro's time-lapse feature will only trigger the shutter release when the camera is in photo mode. 
Now, the biggest consequence of this, at least for the cameras that I talk about on this channel, is that you won't be able to use the frame recording mode to shoot time-lapse videos on the RF's R5C directly in camera. Now, this to me is somewhat doubly frustrating as an R5C owner and user in that the gimbal can, of course, start and stop video recording in normal and slow and fast motion modes just fine if you're trying to shoot video. And this is how things get pretty simple. You have two choices. You can either shoot the way the system was designed, put your camera in photo mode and let the RS3 trigger your shutter, or you can eschew the RS3 controls, control completely and use your camera's own internal time-lapse or interval timer mode without any outside control or functionality at all. Now, due to the way the RS3 is designed, camera setup is also considerably simpler, simpler than it was when we talked through about Edelkron's Slider Plus. If you're shooting if, with a photo camera or the R5C and intend to use the camera as designed or the gimbal as designed, put the camera in photo mode, connect it to the RS3, and let the RS3 control everything for your time-lapse shoot. The alternative to that is to work completely independent of the RS3's camera control. Use your camera's own internal timer or time-lapse movie mode and start and stop the recording manually before starting the, the time-lapse operation on the gimbal. Now, if you do choose to control the camera independently, remember all of the same caveats and cautions apply as they do to any other motion control hardware. The most important of these being that you match the interval on the RS3 to the interval set in your camera so as not to create stuttery videos. Now, as for the rest of your camera settings, here again, the, there's nothing that you have to do differently because you're working on the RS3 than you would on any other motion control hardware or when shooting any other time-lapse. Now, compared to Edelkron's app, DJI's app is somewhat easier to get along with, or at least it seems that way to me. Uh, possibly you could say somewhat less confusing. And in some ways, it's actually somewhat more powerful. So to start with, DJI allows you to set up five different positions that your camera will move between in your time-lapse compared to the three that Edelkron did. Now you can position them by either pushing the camera to where you want it to point or using the joystick on the gimbal or in the app to point the camera that way. Now that said, one thing I did find confusing about this process is how you move or update an existing waypoint to a new position if you need to change it. To do this, you tap the waypoint number under the graph on the app, then wait for your camera to move to that position. Once the camera is in that position, you can move the waypoint using the stick either on the camera or in the app or by pushing the gimbal around, assuming you have push mode enabled. It will automatically save the new position at, or move that waypoint to that position. Now, aside from waypoints, the only other settings you have to deal with in the app are the time-lapse interval and duration. Now, in my look at Edelkron's slider, I spent a lot of time talking about how the slider could extend time lapses and things could get out of sync because if the interval wasn't long enough or the duration as a whole wasn't long enough, the slider couldn't get to the next position and so on and so forth. Interestingly, in my testing with the RS3 Pro, this has not been a problem. Now that might simply be an artifact of rotating versus translating, or it might be because the RS3 Pro is faster, or I'm not really sure, but it does not come up. That said, in any event like the Edelkron system, you do have to take into account your exposure time when setting an interval on the DJI app. And the app doesn't have the ability, even though it's connected to your camera with USB, to determine exactly how long your shutter speed is and figure that out. So you have to plug that in. You have to know your exposure time and plug that into your interval time if it's long enough that it could be a problem. Now, if there's one thing that I have to complain about with the DJI app, it's that it is much harder to enter specific values for the interval and duration than it was in Edelkron's. The overall ranges themselves are actually really reasonable, with intervals going from one second to one minute and durations going from three minutes to six hours. However, you couldn't just tap a field and then type in the time that you wanted. So, 
I think I'm going to wrap this one up here. Of course, if you have a question or if you have one of these and you use it for time lapses and have a tip that I didn't cover, drop it in the comments below. If you found this useful or at least interesting, let me know by hitting that like button and of course, share this video. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Finally, if you'd like to directly support this channel and future content like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can or buying yourself something you've always wanted from the affiliate link in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.